have here at Slocum. It's called Second Tuesdays. I want to thank everybody for coming here. Um, this one is put on by the Nature and Science team. I'd like to introduce, where is he hiding? My husband, Jim. Oh, he's looking at the back wall. And next to him is Craig, and Jenny is there. That's, this is literally the Nature and Science team. Um, we invited the spans here to talk about mineral collecting, something that is near and dear to our hearts. And I'm wearing my hat to, in tribute to Gail, who um, we want all of you to start wearing hats at events like this. I mean, why not? Um, what we've got here are some of the preeminent collectors in our field. Now, it all started with a side trip to the Houston Museum about eight, nine years ago. And they figured out, oh, these are cool. Then they looked it up on the internet and said, oh, we can own them. And they have merrily gone on their way. They've uh, accumulated over 8,500 specimens so far. Jim said modestly 8,500. I think they keep going over that number pretty regularly. Um, and they've got about 40 specimens at the Perot Museum. If you haven't been there, we urge you to go there. It's a fantastic exhibit. There are a lot of people here in the room who have lent specimens to the Perot. Um, it's a real community effort to basically make it one of the finest nature and science museums in the world. And I think it's making its mark now. So if you haven't gone, uh, let us know. We'll get you passes. It's definitely worth the visit. Um, what I'd like to do right now is introduce our couple. There's Gail, there's Jim, uh, and they are the traveling spans. <laughs> well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're not quite sure where best to stand for this, so we may be climbing up and down stairs and pointing the cases here and slides up there, but uh, um, to see if the video guy can uh, keep keep track of us as we walk around. I have to walk. I can't stand still for very long, so bear with us. So I, did I already turn? I was thought I turned it on. That's what the fellow hiding in the corner is good for. <laughs> It worked when we tested it. <laughs> well, welcome this evening, everybody. We're really glad you're here. Um, we have uh, an interesting journey that we've gone through. And uh, we're one of the unusual couples that collects, because usually it's the man and his wife likes to traipse along and, and enjoys it, but has less interest. Or it's the other way around, where the woman is the collector and the husband is less interested. So we're kind of lucky because there's nobody at our house saying no to anything. <laughs> so the dealers really love us because there's nobody saying no. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, that uh, good news, bad news. When, when nobody's saying no, you end up with 8,500 rocks. <laughs> and, and you hardly sell very many. I think we've sold, some folks would say we haven't sold one, but we've actually sold about 100 hundred pieces over the years, but... Uh, and we still cry about yeah, we, them. And we do, we do still <laughs> miss them. It's, uh, it's every time we think about selling a rock, we figure out a way, well, we can sell our firstborn and then I don't have to do that. But, <laughs> but he keeps running away. So, yes, so, but she's sitting and, here, so... And she's sitting right <laughs> here, so she's surviving. <laughs> but these are um, a couple of pieces in our, in our collection. Uh, Wally Mann's over here, and I'm sure he recognizes the one on the right. It's one of his favorites in years past. So we've been acquiring over the years uh, pieces from collectors, other collectors here in the Dallas area, as well as uh, really around the world. The photo on the left is one that uh, we call the Lifesavers for obvious reasons. It's a, a photo that uh, Tom Spann took, who's a professional mineral photographer now, and is, uh, he's just doing a wonderful job for us and others as well. So we call this Spanning the Globe in Search of Fine Minerals. Where have we been and what did we find is uh, the topic uh, we're going to try and address here tonight. This particular slice of uh, lidocodite, a, uh, a variety of tourmaline from Madagascar, is, is one of those head scratches. What in the world makes those shapes and designs and colors? And 
and it uh, has nothing to do with the shape of the outside shape of the of the gem crystal. This is a slice, obviously, but apparently it has everything to do with the uh, the chemistry and even the ions and the electrons and so forth. And Dr. Carter back there can answer any other questions you may have about that because I'm not going to address it. <laughs> this was what we called our cavern of crystals about four years ago. You really want to comment about our living room? Oh, yes. There was a time when it was, um, I was like, no more cabinets in this room because we couldn't fit anybody in there anymore. But it was, um, it was a joyous place to be. But we learned early on that we really needed more space, that our house was certainly never going to be big enough for our appetite for minerals. And so this room has since then been completely gutted. And we've added. We started to add a cavern <laughs> for crystals. And this was uh, just for scale. And it's this, almost 1,000 square feet and about 11 foot roof. This is kind of a safe room line. for minerals so that uh, tornadoes come along and we're not going to be sitting there paranoid that they're all going to go flying with Dorothy. So this so. literally is our, our secure vault. We have a, a, a bank vault door that weighs 1,600 pounds on the, uh, the front of this, about where the photo is being taken. and. Uh, because of the roof line being so high, it was an interesting challenge architecturally, trying to design this room to integrate it right into the, uh, the, the sight lines of the house so it doesn't look like an obvious big structure sticking up in the middle of, uh, the middle of our home. So we tried to make it so somebody trying to come in and do some harm to us, they'd have to, have to figure out where in the world to look first. And, uh, and from that, this is what it looks like today. So this is our new cavern of crystals. We have uh, 18 display cases in there at the moment. <laughs> uh, I figure we can cram at least 16 more in there. No. Yeah, Gail says no. I did. We got, See, we got I, did. I have learned how to say no. So. Not no to minerals, just no to more furniture. <laughs> But, uh, it has uh, since uh, it does have nice furniture in there now, and um, it's it's also it's just a wonderful room, and the copper ceiling. Was, uh, was something that my contractor said, no way, it's going to be too busy. And I was like, yes way, this is going to be really nice. And what it does is just makes it so warm and wonderful in there. It's a great environment to take people into. When you open that door, it just wows them. But then you turn on all the cabinets, and the minerals just are, are just wonderful. Now, we were years ago, we were at a home of a collector out in uh, Arizona who had uh, cabinets behind these curtains that would automatically open. To the, to the tune of Bolero. And, and I'm tempted to do something like that when opening the door. <laughs> Mineral people are unusual people. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we like to entertain uh, fellow collectors. There's uh, uh, actually none of those folks are here in the room tonight. But these are, there's at least two curators and a, and a magazine uh, publisher in that photo. And our dog. And our dogs. He's our, he's our security dog. He's, uh, he makes sure uh, anybody he doesn't know, we know about in a hurry uh, from the barking and growling. Hey, look, honey, I have hair in that picture. <laughs> she has hair in that picture, she says. And that wasn't enough room. This is our overflow room. We have 11 cabinets in here. And I guess we need more space. We need to, we were talking to Keith Williams, he was here last week, of course, and. He said the same thing. You need more cabinets. I can help you. <laughs> and uh, we scratched our hands and said, yeah, I guess you're right. We probably do. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, there's a story here. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> when uh, Jim and I were trying to kill time about eight and a half years ago, we were in Houston, and we went to the Houston Museum. And we had read about rhodochrosite, and Jim wanted to show me the Alma Queen down there. So we went up to the Gem and Mineral Hall. And I don't know, ladies, if your husband is a real slow poke at cabinets that will stand there for 20 minutes, I'm not. I'm fast. I like to go from cabinet to cabinet to cabinet. So while Jim was staring at some minerals at a, a much slower pace than me, I went off into a room and discovered an incredible mineral. And it was this, wolfenite. And there was a big plate of it in the, mineral, in the museum. And I stood there just absolutely in awe. And I thought, there's no way that nature made this. This was made by man. No way. 
So I reached in my bag and I pulled out a napkin and an eyeliner pencil, because that's all I had, and I wrote Wolfenite. And I was just, I went away, came back, went away, came back. When I come back three times to something, that means I'm just completely smitten. So I was smitten with Wolfenite. Jim was smitten with whatever's on the next slide. Yeah, as she mentioned that uh, I was trying to take her to see the Alma Queen, which is a really fabulous, maybe the finest rhodochrosite in the world. It happens to be in the Houston Museum here in, in the state. And, uh, and we were going there because we had just bought our first rhodochrosite in a retail store, Breckenridge, Colorado. And she looked at me and said something to the effect, we paid how much money for a rock? And I uh, said, so wait, 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 let me show you what these really look like. <laughs> and uh, off we went to the Houston Museum. This is uh, from our collection, more of probably our finest rhodochrosite. Uh, uh, I think it's at the Perot right now. Isn't it, it is you? at the Perot. This is in the uh -huh. Perot Museum. So if you want to see it up close and personal, it's uh, on display there for the next couple of years. Uh, okay. The Sweet Home Mine, uh, where these came from, uh, as the crow flies, is only about four miles from a winter home that our family had on uh, Hoosier Pass, except you can't get there during the winter time when we were usually out there skiing. It was, it was one of those, uh, over the, literally on the other side of the Continental Divide, it's something like 11,000, 12,000 feet in elevation. So if you can imagine uh, swinging a pickaxe or a hammer or shoving a cart full of rocks at 12,000 feet, if you've ever been to high altitude, that's hard work. That's and these hard. guys uh, earned every bit of what they, uh, they get paid uh, for working up there. One of the things that uh, um, came out of uh, about that same time is Gail and I are both looking online when we realize we can buy these things, as Mary pointed out. She's on one uh, laptop uh, searching the internet and, and finds a, a, a dealer. I'm on a, another laptop and I happen to find uh, Rob Levinsky, who's here somewhere uh, from the Arkansas. And we're both looking at these things and she turns around and says something to the effect of what? Hey, honey, you can buy this stuff. And we've been doing it ever yeah, since. we've been buying it ever since. <laughs> so one of the first things he bought... Was an Inosite. Not this one, but a small one. But in the picture that I looked at on the computer, it was a good-sized piece. And I'm looking at this thinking, I want to order that. Wow, it was on an auction, so I bid on it, and I won it. And when it came, it was this big. <laughs> And I was like, what is, I got ripped off. Because I learned that centimeters aren't like inches. <laughs> and now we have a centimeter ruler in front of every possible exactly. laptop that can get on the internet. It's, this and, is what the centimeter And I love is. that piece to this day, yeah. by the way. And we still have that, uh, <laughs> that, that piece, her, her first. Um, and, and we put it next to another one very similar to this. It was the salmon pink colored uh, inosite from this very same mine. So, so this bigger... Uh, piece that has quite an interesting uh, uh, history in terms of collecting uh, uh, past as well as from that same location. What's even funnier, ladies, is that my first piece came wrapped in dry laundry detergent so that the crystals wouldn't be broken. And so it was like in the old days when my mom used to buy laundry detergent, and she'd open it up and pull out a glass or knives or whatever used to come as a freebie in there. So I thought it was like a bonus that I got this laundry detergent. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I was wondering what these little pieces of wolfenite were that I was pulling out of my shirt pockets after they'd been washed. That explains it. This was, we, we like to have fun with our minerals and, and we got this, uh, oh, yeah. this little rhodochrosite. It's um, actually quite large. I'll have to show you a photo of it in a minute. It's uh, kind of one of the stars at the Perot Museum right now. And uh, um, Yale pulled out this can of whipped cream and a spoon and she had this funny smirk on her face and handed me her cell phone and said, here, take my picture. And uh, <laughs> she fools with us. We ended up making this uh, the cover of an invitation uh, card that we sent out to folks. We called it, uh, come join us for brunch with a crunch. <laughs> and and uh, she was serving uh, rhodochrosite that Well, the that funny day. thing is that I have it on my iPad. And when I um, docent up at the museum, at the Perot Museum, this piece is there, and um, people will admire it, and I'll say, isn't this a beautiful piece? And they'll say, yeah, and I'll say, well, it actually belongs to me and my husband. They go, come on, get real. And then I'll pull out that picture, and I'll show, see, yes, it really is mine. So <laughs> It's a beauty. We call it the, uh, the Wutong Princess. It's, that's the name of the mine. 
Um, I'm going to skip over some of the interesting stories. It's a long story with this one. The punchline is that there's um, two other pieces from this same find that are larger, both owned by the government of China at this point. Uh, one they call the, uh, the Emperor of China, and the other is the Empress of China. And this is the next largest one, largest certainly in, in uh, private hands, so we call it the Wutong Princess. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, the size-wise, it's almost uh, uh, 10 inches, uh, 9, it's 10 beautiful. inches across. It's a, it's it's a, a big, beautiful piece. Uh, timing is everything. I think the folks who had been working on this had just pulled it out of the box and put it in the case. We spotted it as we walked in down to the bottom on the floor in the case, and we both stepped back and said, how much is that doggy in the window? I want that one. <laughs> Uh, Talking about on display at the Perot. So, who here has been to the Perot? Wow, oh, quite a all few. right. Yeah, most of them. Quite a few people. Well, Jim and I got actively involved, as did a number of the MAD members, with this museum. And, um, and uh, we stepped up a little bit and uh, really got into the mineral hall and designing and all that and worked with the architects. And so, we're really proud that they came to us and asked a number of the MAD, MAD members. Um, if we would loan them minerals for three years. So we've already started changing things out there because there's such an interest. It's the number one draw to the museum is the Gem and Mineral Hall. And Gail is a docent there every Tuesday almost. Every Tuesday and, uh, when I'm not going through chemo, I'm there. So Now rumor <laughs> has it that there. you have to shoo away the other volunteers and the employees because they all want to come down and <laughs> listen to what you have to say about it's the stories of this of piece and that point piece. I have so a she's blast popular when I'm there. there so. We decided um, several years ago, this is now six years ago, to uh, enter a competition at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. And we decided to go for the topmost prize, best case of minerals in the show, which is called the Desitels Trophy. And uh, it turned out in our first try, uh, we did win that trophy. And this was the case we had. And a few of those pieces are actually in the uh, display case here in the corner, uh, if you're interested. And we had. Uh, 36 specimens in that case, and, and uh, she, is, she made me swear that I wouldn't put any more than, than that in a competition pay, case again, um, so I didn't. This year when we won again, we had 36 pieces in the case. <laughs> <laughs> but this Jim was, likes uh, to put lots Our second time that. around was earlier this, uh, this year, and this was the, the, uh, the display case with uh, uh, the ribbon up in the top corner there. Several of these pieces are also on display here, so we bought a, a mix of, uh, of uh, each of those competition cases. So that was, that was a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of work. A lot of work. It's quite a challenge to try and figure out which 36 pieces out of 8,500 you want to bring and put in a, a display of any sort, never mind that you think might meet the judging uh, criteria for uh, uh, whether it be a variety of uh, minerals with rarities and and unusual locations. Uh, in the bottom, actually in the front right corner there is uh, one we got here at the Heritage Auction in uh, June last year. It's also in the case over in the corner. It's the, the copper inside the copper skull, which I'll have a photo of here in a minute. But uh, we had a lot of fun putting this case together and it was, uh, it was well received. Uh, I think the biggest compliment we got uh, uh, was that this was a a very intelligent display case, and I, I thought that was the, the ultimate in terms of, uh, of uh, congratulations when people say it's not just a lot of glitz. Well, you know, the funny thing is, too, it's like two nights before we're leaving to go to Tucson, I'm wrapping these cases, wrapping all of the shelves and everything late at night, stapling and everything else. We always seem to get so caught up in so much work. Yeah, the, the risers she's referring to, which are steps in there, you, get, you end up, they give you an empty case, so it's flat bottom nothing but wood sides. You have to make the, the, the wall liners as well as the, the risers. And she picked uh, this fabulous fabric to put in there. What we forgot to account for was the folding of the fabric on the ends. We had it so precisely measured that I literally had to pull the pieces out and trim off the fabric on the end to squeeze it in there to make it fit. But you can't oh, tell. Wow. <laughs> this is one of our favorites. Uh, just an extraordinary appetite, floor appetite from Portugal. It is in the case over here on display if you're interested in looking at it up close. 
it literally changes color depending on what kind of light is on it. In fact, as we were setting it up with these uh, uh, different white lights in the display case, it's so transparent, we put it in one place and it, it absolutely disappeared. It was no color, the light went right through it. It was uh, uh, so clean. And then we had to move it around and find uh, where's not enough light where you can get some color, but not so much light that it uh, washes it out. And uh, it'll be either blue one day or one light and dark purple like this and others. So it, uh, if you see different photos with different colors, it's just, yep, it really can be that way. It's a, in a sense a color changer based on what kind of light you have. Um, we like it. We like, we like it a lot. lot. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a joke in there somewhere. You want to talk about our calcite? Oh, this beauty. This was offered to us um, when somebody was on their way to Tucson and we snagged it up pretty quick because it, it was gorgeous. <coughs> it, the color is really unique for calcite and uh, it's from China. It's, it's a, the, the pink is from the manganese, therefore mangano calcite. Uh, it's also the same colorant for rhodochrosite, uh, which is a, a manganese mineral as well. And in this particular case, as Gail mentioned, that a dealer was on his way through Talos going to Tucson for the big show, and, and these had just come out of China. The talk was there's only five or six of these. Trust me, trust me. Yes, it's one of those, yes, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> how many thousands will there be at the show when you, when you get there, which is usually the case. So the price ended up being reflective of that because the dealer didn't know either. They just came out. Long story short, this ended up being the best one that ever came out. And there really were only five or six. So the same dealer was running around buying up everybody else's pieces that they had and selling them for three times what we paid for them. We've done good with that one, yeah. except for the ones where we didn't. It's always nice <laughs> to. So on average, we think we're ahead. Uh, crystalline gold. This, uh, this, this brilliant little piece, it's uh, just over an inch um, in size, um, is, is got amazing uh, crystal form and hoppered, uh, flattened. Uh, they want to be octahedral crystals, and there's some what's called twinning involvement. Many of you folks uh, understand the lingo, but uh, uh, it's just a beautiful piece that uh, I thought we'd throw up for some, uh, some glitz here. There's, there's another story about buyer beware, and if you're interested, I'll tell you about it later, but I won't go through it now. <laughs> the gold is interesting because people always think of it as a nugget when it's been rolled around and it's very malleable, but it's really gorgeous crystalline forms. The, the former owner of this piece just went ooh behind me, so he recognizes <laughs> it. Uh, this was an ex-Wally Man piece, it's right here in the front row. And uh, we are very, very pleased to be the next caretaker of this fine piece, thank you very much. It's uh, depending on which side of the DFW metroplex you come from, the TCU folks call this the horn frog, and we prefer to call it the Gila monster. So it's, uh, it's uh, just amazing uh, uh, gold from California. The Colorado quartz mine has uh, uh, just, just spectacular gold, so uh, you know, mined mostly for mineral specimens. One of the things about minerals is that they're beautiful and they're colorful and they're glitzy and there's so many different things about minerals and people should collect minerals because they love what they are and the piece should speak to you just like art did. I come from the art world, I owned an art gallery and this is the next transition for me is nature's art. It's beautiful. Speaking of nature's art, we call this the praying mantis. It's a, uh, a silver crystal, uh, a very old specimen from a place called Batapias in uh, in Mexico, which is an old, old uh, uh, silver mine. We've had more fun with this. It's, it's, it's not by any means our biggest piece, not even close, actually. Mm. Uh, it's only about, uh, as uh, uh, scale goes, uh, two and a half inches or so across. It's right there in the case. It happens to be in the case over here. But it's uh, such a stunning piece, and that one long backbone is a single crystal, that long spinel twin. Um, and if you look closely in the photo and at the piece, it's actually kind of an extended cube. It's got four sharp corners, sharp faces, all the way out the end of it uh, with other um, uh, spinel twin crystals coming down as uh, almost like a comb off the side. And it was encased in quartz at one time and they etched away the quartz and that's what you get. And this, this one uh, um, has also some acanthite with it, which is the black uh, mineralization uh, near the bottom. Mm -hmm. 
I mentioned the uh, the copper in the copper skull. This is the closest thing to a dodecahedral copper we've ever seen. It's a it's a pretty pretty amazing piece. Uh, um, we were bidding on this, and it was it was featured in the promotions, and, and these folks were real real smart in promoting it because uh, uh, although your your estimate on what what it would go for was it ended up being a lot lower than what it costs us to buy it, but. Uh, there were a lot of folks that were uh, actively trying to acquire this piece and, uh, until uh, everyone else said, Uncle, and we got it. <laughs> well, little did I know, while we were bidding for it, somebody was bidding against us. It turns out to be one of my best friends who didn't know that he was bidding against us. So when had, I won it, a, I sent a picture of it, and I went, <laughs> he, he had a proxy uh, <laughs> bidding for it, and he was the kind of guy where he would typically own something for a year and then sell it to us for twice as much anyway. So. <laughs> oh, oh, he's still a friend. <laughs> ah, this beauty. This, uh, the, this almost looks like a gumdrop. The uh, uh, Smithsonite on quartz is uh, such, a, such a stunning piece. This is a photo of Tom Spantuck, and uh, I mentioned Tom several times. Joe Budd is here somewhere. There's several of his photos, there he is, several of his photos Another in the slideshow as well. So we were blessed with having a couple of great mineral photographers right here in town. And uh, this happened to be one that Tom took that, uh, that I absolutely love. It's, uh, it kind of glows. And it's only this big, right. okay? <laughs> but sometimes the most beautiful ones are the small ones. This is also a Smithsonite. It, um, I call it... Uh, Glacial orbs. It's almost like it's kind of a glacier green, like a, like an ice. And these are these are fairly large crystals. They're about uh, four centimeters across and um, absolutely transparent uh, end to end. And yeah, I've not seen anything else like this piece. Uh, these guys who've seen a lot more than I have are shaking their heads. It's uh, uh, it happens to be when it, when asked what's my favorite in the collection, this is the one that always comes to mind. And it's in the case right here, so we can, it is also we can talk about it with you after if you like. What's also interesting, at least mineralogically, you have these unusual orbs, which are, well, let's leave it at that. But there's a second habit down in the bottom right there. You also have rhombohedral crystal, a completely different habit of smithsonite, which is the more typical form on this exact same piece. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting for several different reasons. Ah. Now, that's the one that I said would be my favorite if asked, <laughs> Gail. <laughs> it's, it's actually my number one favorite piece in our collection. And again, it's in the case right here. And when I first laid eyes on it, it was on a giant poster for the Dallas show. And I looked at it and said, oh my god, that's absolutely beautiful. Well, it was in England at the time in a collection. and. I had a little postcard of it, and I put it next to my nightstand, and I would look at it when I go to sleep at night, thinking, gosh, that's just a beautiful piece, how amazing it's called a propeller. And uh, Well, it turns out the couple in England split up, and somehow that mineral just kind of filtered its way through the, across the Atlantic and came to our doorstep, and so it's in our collection. So now, my version it, of so. that story. <laughs> <laughs> She is so much in love with this poster. She's telling every dealer who will listen to her, I've got to own that piece. I and know. guess what? A dealer who got a hold of it said, how do you negotiate down with the price on this one? Now? <laughs> and she, and then he knows I've got to own this piece. And uh, it's one of those go part. Maybe over time we'll leverage out <laughs> and we own this piece. But as it turned out, it was a great, a great, uh, great opportunity. Piece. Yeah, as I think of it, it's, uh, it's, it's long past gone, long since gone past what we paid for yes. it in terms of uh, value today, so by a multiple or two. And obviously, we call it the propeller for obvious reasons. What's interesting, and you can make out here, although um, not quite as uh, sharp as with a light right directly on them, these are bright, bright crimson red special king garnets on and included in the, uh, the aquamarines. It gives it a really nice uh, uh, to extra do touch. That had a lot to do with why I liked it so much. Yeah. This is, this is um, many, not only collectors, but dealers' favorite uh, mineral. It's a, a, a gem, gem crystal end-to-end. -end. It's a, a little over six inches long. Uh, uh, we have everything listed in centimeters, obviously. And, and any part of this, if you were into cutting gemstones, you could make a wonderful, uh, clean uh, gem out of this. This was 
uh, the shorthand version of the Medina story is there was uh, several dealers that happened to be in the right place at the right time. They could only afford to, to save 12 of these crystals from uh, this fabulous new discovery in Brazil that occurred. And um, uh, this was one of those. And, and I think, I've, I've, I haven't seen all 12. I've seen most of them. I like this one best. It's by no means the biggest. In fact, um, one of the auction, Heritage auctions here this last year had one of those pocket mates on, on sale. And uh, I think that was also the June auction, if I recall. And um, uh, quite a number of dealers uh, would say, if, if you ever, ever want to sell this, we've got a list this long of people that <laughs> want to buy it. Not for sale. Not for sale. <laughs> it's at the Perot Museum, as a matter of fact. You can go see it there. So. They, it's it's uh, so, Jamie, they've done a great job at the museum. They've, they have it on angle. And they've put a uh, fiber optic light on one end. You can't see the light inside the crystal at all. And the other end glows. It's as if somebody puts it, put a, uh, uh, a bright headlight on the opposite end. It's, it's throwing off light from the inside out, which is really really interesting way to display it. We have a few blue caps. Um, this is our, our current suite of uh, five blue cap tourmalines. Um, our son Tom here, who's, uh, who's got uh, working on his fifth child on the way. His eldest is, uh, what is she now, 12 or 11? Her very first word was uh, blue cap tourmaline. <laughs> so, yes. Not quite. <laughs> but she had it right. She first time she came to visit, she looked at it and said, "Grandpa, that's a blue cap tourmaline." My jaw dropped. I said, "That's right." <laughs> but um, we we love these things. There's uh, there's not very many of these around either. Uh, again, there's a Wally Man piece on this photo. The one in the front right is uh, from his fine collection. This we call the, the space shuttle. There's actually uh, two crystals from the same mine, the same rocket pocket that, uh, that have that, uh, that label. This one is uh, three and a half, almost, uh, uh, actually I take it back, it's almost four and a half inches. The other one is, is about uh, less than an inch. So it's a great photograph, but it's a lot tinier. Um, we've had more fun with this one than uh, um, it does look like it's taking off, like Flash Gordon. You see, you've got these, <laughs> these uh, uh, the, the green sceptered over, over a rubellite red uh, tourmaline here. It's, uh, we've had a lot of fun with it. And again, as you change the uh, position of the lighting, you get different colors. It can be a solid grass green one day. And in this photo, you can see there's actually quite a bit of blue tint uh, in there as well. We ended up recently uh, being able to acquire the little brother of this piece, which is in the display over here. It looks very, very similar to it, so we call it the blue space shuttle. <laughs> you have to name all 8,500 pieces, and you have to pass the test when you're done, so. From the Wawa Mountains. Yep, um, red barrel is probably the, red, the rarest of the barrel uh, uh, species. Um, to my knowledge, it's only from this one location in, uh, in Utah, and they never get very large. This one's under two centimeters roughly three quarters of an inch. And I don't think the largest is much more than an inch, 25, 28 millimeters thereabouts. Um, so these are, are, are rare and small, but absolutely gemmy and brilliant red. And uh, uh, this was the featured uh, specimen for the t-shirts and show poster for the East Coast Gem and Mineral Show. And I think that was 2009 mm -hmm. that we were uh, the featured exhibitors for that. So, so it's, uh, it's fun to see your piece on somebody's t-shirt walking around a show, and uh, this was one of those. I just follow along with the black magic marker signing everybody's chest, you know. <laughs> ah, the this The really big ones are probably all in what we euphemistically call the black hole. The, most all the mines are owned by one collector, and he keeps everything they produce. So we don't know what's really out there. Uh, but of those we've but seen, ours this is, right is uh, here. Yeah, ours is here. Enjoyment. It's on top shelf there. <laughs> and um, when, when we had the opportunity to buy this, it was priced based on uh, how many 10 karat gemstones the jewelers could cut from this, because that's who we were competing with for, their, for the crystal to keep it intact was, uh, was the gem cutters. And I'm, Always fighting I'm glad we got cutters. it. You want to talk about the, uh, the prospectors? Oh, yes. Has anybody seen the TV show, The Prospectors, on the Weather Channel? 
season two. Season two, episode eight, Jim and I are in that one. <laughs> we had a blast with that. Um, and so I think it was, good. you know, of course it's all melodrama, you know, it's, and they have to add weather in there because it's a weather channel, but it's really been kind of fun. And they asked if we would come and show who buys these minerals after they dig them out and clean them up and bring them to a show. Where do they go? And so we went in and, and we literally were buying and they filmed us for four and a half hours for like four minutes worth of, you know, actual TV time. But we had a blast with it. And so this is a piece that was dug out by one of the people on the show, The Prospectors, Rich Frederick. And, and Gene Kalman, yeah. the, the, the partnership. So. This was uh, one of the pieces they found in, uh, during the, the filming of that program. As it turns out, as the, the name of the pocket is the Tribute Pocket. It was a rediscovery of a, of a find originally made by a fellow by the name of Ed Over in the 1950s. The, the location, he never told anybody where it was, so it was lost for 60 years. And uh, just rediscovered here this last year, and they found bigger and better things than he ever had. Uh, and this was one of them. It's got, you can see that color banding. That's literally what uh, the crystal looks like uh, with this dark sherry red band uh, across one side. It's absolutely transparent end to end. With a black background, we're looking at something that is uh, 84 millimeters deep uh, in that direction. So call it three and a half, four inches of, uh, of gem material all the way across with a champagne uh, topaz uh, underneath it. It's, uh, it's just an amazing piece. Uh, what I did not include for space reasons was the uh, crystal we have with uh, the cap on it. We're looking at uh, what is a cleave face. There's a, clap, a cap that, that's locked fit right on top of what is the front face here. You turn it on end and you've got a perfectly shaped topaz crystal about uh, so big and, and uh, um, you never know that, uh, that it had been cleaved away and, and uh, uh, we decided not to repair it but to just pull it off to look at this wonderful gem uh, interior uh, uh, on display. It's what we do late at night. We sit there and we take things on and off of minerals <laughs> and we just play with them. They're just great fun. And this is another piece that's from some people on the Prospector show, the Doris family. They're really, really super nice people. And we went digging with them, so we really enjoy that. Sometimes Jim and I actually do crawl around in the dirt. We go into mines and we go digging. And we went to Sweden and we were digging in road cuts. And We actually each found fun. a topaz in their topaz claims we in Colorado. We found topaz. That was fun. Yeah, that was pretty exciting. <laughs> with rakes. You didn't have to even like get super dirty. You just raked all day long until you found yeah, topaz. Yeah, we were gardening wow. for topaz. <laughs> so what else comes up? <laughs> that was pretty cool. But these, um, uh, these Amazonites uh, from, in this case, the Lucky Monday pocket are are among the, uh, the richest uh, in color uh, that they've ever found. They're of the caliber of what's called the tree root pocket that were quite a number of years ago. It was probably 10 years ago that those were found and, and um, um, very rich in color. And what's also un unusual is the uh, translucent, almost transparent uh, smoky quartz uh, uh, where you can, you can quite literally see quite a lot of light uh, through these. And there's got to be a lot of natural radiation in the soil to make the smoky quartz that dark there. Yeah, the black is from, uh, from natural radiation exposure over the eons. 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 Be and then there's the halo piece. <laughs> Which story do you want to tell? <laughs> Real quickly, Jim was in Houston doing business, and I was roaming around the show, just kind of bored, and I went to visit the Doors family. And I walked in, and I said, what's going on? And they pulled this piece out that they had gotten and I said, geez, that's kind of cool. It looks like it has an afro. It's really neat. I love it. Um, how much is it? And they said, 22. And I said, oh, okay, I'll take it. Do you take a credit card? And they kind of looked at me funny and they said, yeah. And they ran the credit card and I thought it was $2,200, but it was not $2,200. <laughs> it had an extra zero on the end and I gulped hard, signed the card. And all the way out the door with the box in my arm, I'm going, Jim's going to kill me. Jim's going to kill me. Jim's going to kill me. Jim did not kill me. Well, I'm still here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> she, she worked. She set me up, worked me up to it. I sent I, him pictures. And she sends me a text message saying, I, I bought an Amazonite today. And I, and I sent back, um, I'm just getting up off the floor because that's never been a mineral she was particularly fond of prior to these recent discoveries. She saw that and thought that I was really upset, but she hadn't told me how much she paid for the darn thing. <laughs> no. 
and this goes on and on for a few weeks now. And, and I suddenly start getting all this feedback. I'm not sure if she'd set these dealers up or what, but people would be sending me notes as to, oh, you got that fabulous halo pocket piece. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and just one after another. Is, well, I was slipping I guess a lot of $20 bills okay. to my friends, you know, I was asking them to do it. Speaking of the Rockies, this is a bit further north. Uh, uh, we think is the finest aquamarine uh, found in North America. Brian Lees in, uh, in Denver at the Collector's Edge will quibble with that. He has a wonderful uh, aquamarine from Mount Ontario called the Rabbit Ears, but we think this is right up there. It is, it is really that blue. It is a, a deep blue. It's absolutely gem transparent through and through. And, uh, but it's from Idaho. It's from, I mean, from Idaho. What the just, a, just a spectacular piece. It's not huge, but neither is his either. Uh, crystal size is about the same. His, his piece is on Matrix, this is not. That's one distinction, but uh, I really love this one. Uh, it is not in the display case there, but it was in our competition case. This is, a, this is an interesting uh, mineral photograph, location, provenance of ownership, a lot of different stories. Millerite is a, is a fairly rare nickel mineral. The, the, the brassy looking spines and spires, that radial spray is, uh, is the millerite. The, Kind of the uh, golden brown on the left is uh, it's, it's ferroin dolomite, which is a dolomite that has iron in its chemical structure. It gives it this wonderful golden, uh, this brownish color and uh, and uh, uh, round shape. And it's in a a vug lined with uh, magnetite that once was hematite blades. So it's got a lot of interesting things inside of a bright red iron ore. Say that in one breath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and. <laughs> What, um, what's interesting about this, there's a couple of interesting things. The, the uh, curator of the Smithsonian, Jeff Post, is absolutely a fanatic of these specimens from this location. He had been to our home one time. He walked in the door. This was in a case that was probably halfway across the length of this room. He spotted it as he walked in the door and went okay. straight to it and uh, was admiring that. So it was a, a great way to make a first impression when somebody Again, falls in love with a piece like that. We have it here. So it's over here on this plane. This is a, a new find. It was actually two years ago, but uh, three now, but uh, just came out of Canada. Um, as you may know, they have uh, in Canada the, the um, Heritage Fund, I think they call it, that uh, the Canadian museums have first right to any really good minerals that come out of the mines, and this was on hold for a couple of years along with several others similar. They made their selection, and this was the next one on the bubble that, uh, that escaped, and we were able to uh, uh, acquire this great thing. Single crystal, 12 millimeters, almost square, with uh, no fractures. It's uh, just an amazing piece, and this happens to be where they first discovered sperolite. And oh, by the way, this is a platinum mineral, so it's a, a, a rare uh, uh, precious metal as well. And um, um, in a natural vug, natural cavity, so many times that you get these from uh, Russia, they've been etched out of uh, whatever the matrix rock, usually a calcopyrite, uh, uh, would happen to hold it. Oh, I'm just going to say that, in case you haven't noticed, we don't, we don't adhere to collecting just one particular style or from one particular area. We collect worldwide, all sizes, and every location possible. So. This one we've had for quite a while. Gail calls this the, uh, the Dr. Seuss calcite. Is that right? Yeah, Dr. Seuss tree. Dr. Seuss tree. Uh, I call it the pagoda calcite. It's, uh, these, uh, it's, it's a marvel that we've carried this around several times and still haven't broken it. So it's a, that's the good news. And uh, it's on display over here. It's on display. Come so we it. decided to bring it along for one more time to show you all. But uh, it's just, a fascinating piece. Just to test piece. our luck. And, uh, um, Who'd have thought you could have uh, uh, a common mineral like calcite to uh, uh, create something as aesthetic as this? It's amazing. Talking about aesthetic, this was one of the very first disco balls that came out of uh, a, an unusual <laughs> discovery in uh, India. Um, well, they were digging probably wells, been, I believe. Yeah, eight or nine years ago now, uh, maybe even longer. But uh, they've since dug two more wells in that same little village and, and found a new apophyte pocket in each of them, just like they did here. They're digging 
you can call it digging, they're cutting into lava beds. So this is solid lava they're digging down into to find uh, uh, water uh, originally. Uh, and on the way, they, uh, they, they end up breaking into these open caverns that are big enough for people to not quite walk Wouldn't into, but fun? certainly crawl into and uh, pull out things like this. What a treat that would be if you dug a well and found something like that. Huh? Then everybody could have their own disco ball. <laughs> We, we call this the dolphin for uh, obvious reasons. It's a, a, a relatively small piece, almost two inches, that uh, um, is, is on display over here. It's just a neat, neat thing from Venezuela. We learned several years later after getting this fine piece that, that um, it's one of the very, very few, possibly the only one on Matrix. Um, the miners didn't know any better. They would find these gold crystals and they were breaking them off the, the Matrix. Uh, for the, the, the company that was doing this uh, production, thinking that's what they wanted. It wasn't until they actually went down there and they stopped them. They happened to be in the process of recovering this one and came out with the matrix uh, still attached to the, uh, to the this wonderful gold wire, uh, which is a rare habit all by itself. Want to comment about the uh, the optase? Just that it's an unusual combination, and it's the piece is about yay big, but it's just really beautiful, and it glistens, and uh, it's a real eye catcher. Especially when I bring women in to show them, they just always sort of connect with that particular piece. This is one of those I call it a crossover piece. There's her description about women and how fabulous it looks aesthetically, and then there's the scientific description. It's really really rare to have green diaptase like this on. Wolfenite from anywhere, never mind from uh, from Sumed Mine in Namibia, and uh, and as Wolfenites go, that's that's pretty big, and uh, for for I think I didn't mark it, but it's about again. four centimeters. Speaking of Wolfenites, this yeah. is front and back of the same piece um, from it's the Red Cloud Mine. Just beautiful. And and Red Cloud Wolfenites are are kind of the epitome of. Wolfenites generally, the, the, the color and the, right. the, uh, uh, the, the, the translucency really rich in color. Really gorgeous. is, is uh, unique. And in a cabinet with lights, they just absolutely glow. Now what's, what's also unusual about this piece is it's on uh, quartz. Not only that, but it actually has a, a bit of an amethyst uh, color to it. And um, I've since learned that that's also very rare for uh, uh, this location. So having anything other than... Uh, for simplicity's sake, the, the limonite, the, the matrix, typically is a, is a, is a brown, uh, very friable or crumbly uh, uh, kind of a matrix that uh, uh, the crystals are, are resting in. So you have to be doubly careful with them because the crystals can come off so easily. These are on there pretty rigidly. But we still have to be careful. <laughs> and this is one of my babies. Um, not that it's not ours, but I had been talking to some friends in England and I was saying, what is your holy grail? What is the mineral? And they were saying, Laroconite. Oh, Laroconite. I'm like, Laroconite. Well, I have been looking online and it's a small pale dusting of blue on some rocks. And I was sort of unimpressed and, and um, curious as to why they liked them so well. And then I was at a show and we discovered this one, which is maybe... I don't know, it's about yay big. It's not very big, but it's the crystals are big on it, and it's beautiful, and so we got it. And it ended up being the cover of a magazine later, which somebody no. called us and said, did you know your piece is on this cover of a magazine? The largest in magazine on minerals in the world, no less. And, uh, and we were shocked. But anyway, it's just it's in our collection now. We have quite a collection of Laroconite, um, but it is hard to find good-sized crystals in this. These, yeah. these were generally mined around 1850 in that period of time, so it's been on the ground a long time. It had uh, quite a lot of owners before we got to it, or I should say got it, got to it because it was, uh, it was sideways and they glued to a, inside of a box. And I, I <laughs> detached it and, I, and it had four different layers of different kinds of glue over the literally <laughs> the century. And I, and I painstakingly uh, put solvents on it and picked away under a microscope and cleaned it up. And Jeff Scoville happened to be coming into town uh, doing photography for us. And I showed this to him and he took this shot. And, and, and he's over in Europe and a few months later. He calls all excited. You wouldn't believe that shot we took. It's on the cover. 
of uh, Lapis Magazine. And, uh, People look at the cover, and the cover's this big, you know, and then you show them the mineral. So in front was, of it, it's this big. It was, it was worth picking at the little rock to get all the glue up. <laughs> Emphasis. Talking about little rocks. Here's another. Uh, we collect all From sizes. Montana. And, yeah. and it's just uh, this is a thumbnail. They call it thumbnail when it fits in a one inch by one inch box. Um, and so it's officially a thumbnail. And it's just beautiful. The color is teal green. And under the right light, it just glows across the room. So we have a nice suite of five of them sitting very nicely. Um, on Including the what we believe is the largest one. Yeah. Um, I didn't happen to bring that photo, but. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a lot of interesting stories. It was a, a unique find. Um, folks had to scramble before the dynamite blast occurred, and they got what they got, and there were no more. And um, best I can tell, that's still true. This, uh, this wonderful fluorite, uh, you've got these elongated um, cubic crystals. It's, uh, what color do you call that? Is that lavender, uh, pink, purple, or all of the above? All uh, of the above from a, a very old uh, ancient mine. Uh, I believe this is a lead mine in, uh, in Weardale, England. Pretty unusual formation. I love the crystalline part of mineral collecting. This is a piece that was probably one of the best pieces that came out of that same mine with the big uh, whipped cream and the spoon shot. Um, a little bit different shape and everything from that. Very, very much similar to the Sweet Home Mine rhodochrosites with the fluorites. And so we're really honored to have this piece because that mine is no more. It's, uh, it's gone. So, And this turned out to be a unique piece. When we first were offered this, uh, we were promised the ability to trade up if they found better ones. There, there were no more. So this was not only the only one, it was the, clearly the best one. That's and a nice combination variety. with fluorite. And as we've since learned, the white on there is kutnohorite, another manganese mineral, and uh, uh, makes for a really aesthetic uh, uh, combination. This was on display for a year at the University of Arizona until uh, just this past February. That's the other fun part is loaning minerals out to museums and things. It's just kind of a, a nice way to give back to the community. And this mm, thing, we this, have never forget this. This is a thing. weird thing. It's, it's, it's not a stalactite in the, in the conventional sense because you tend to have concentric rings mixing with minerals that don't let light through. Uh, uh, the Argentina uh, slices that you may be familiar with that have, if you look at them from the side, you, you don't get any light crosswise. This is absolutely uh, translucent. You put it in the sunlight and it glows. It's uh, uh, quite red with, with pyrite attached. And we've had, uh, it originally came, uh, came out, in fact, again, I'm going to point to Wally here. In 79, he had, uh, his, the shop he was working at had, had gotten, uh, acquired this piece um, he said he'd, he'd seen a photo of this. This must have been at least 20 years later, maybe 25 years later. I've seen that piece. He goes home and he finds it in an issue of the magazine dated 1980 and said, see, I told you it was here. And, uh, and that had a uh, Santa Eulalia, Mexico uh, label on it. And, and all the experts we've had look at this has created quite a debate because the folks from Mexico, especially the experts uh, from here, says it could be. If it is, I've got to own it. But I'm not sure. I've never seen anything like it. And uh, others say, it's, oh, no, it's Peru. It could be Japan. It could be Argentina. So we've been just having a great time with the mystery on it. Uh, hey, Jim, I was talking to Ken Roberts of Tucson. Yes? He originally sold that. I do remember that. And his, uh, he had his name on that, uh, that photo caption. And, uh, and, and I don't know if you asked me about this piece, but he, he had no recollection, last I heard, of well, where it uh, had come from. Yeah. yeah, and uh, this this was the center center it's point like a case of the, worm. <laughs> uh, uh, the the Mad Club uh, 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 case in uh, Tucson this year had this in the, the center, so we were honored to have that uh, in the middle of the case. Here's a here's a interesting story. I'll let Gail tell her version this, of it much um, longer. <laughs> this is a beautiful big quartz sitting in kitty litter in a dog dish. And the reason was it was brought to us, and it, we couldn't lay it down. We couldn't stand it up. We didn't know what to do with it. And we were given like 12 hours to make up our mind if we wanted to it buy it or not. It weighed about 50 pounds. So it's not something it's you big. can hold real easily. It's pretty darn big, and it's really heavy because, you know, Ambitus quartz is like nature's glass. And so um, we're looking at that, and it's got some broken bits on it. And it's got iron staining on it, and we were given a price. And 
we sat up all night researching, and we found out it's pretty much the pocket mate to the one in the Smithsonian, and so we agreed to buy it. And we sent it out to a professional to clean it and trim it. And we lost about four inches off the bottom of it, but we took the excess, and we had gemstones cut out of it, which was pretty cool. And this is what we ended up with afterwards. And this is in the Perot Museum now. So it was a real gamble whether we wanted to spend that kind of money on, on, at the time, what we thought was just another amethyst quartz. But it ended up being a, a rarity. That mine closed in the early 1960s, and so there are no more. We're, we're told that that's one of the, uh, uh, the top three, both in size and, and, and quality. And we're told that by the, the folks that own the other two. So it's a question of yeah. which they order. <laughs> And it has five anhydros in it, so it has prehistoric water. So at the museum, the kids all picture Jurassic Park and trying to make dinosaurs from DNA. And There's all actually that stuff. a U-shaped track in the top of the leftmost crystal there. So imagine taking something 50 pounds and trying to go like this to make the bubble move around. But it does; it moves around. So it's a pretty cool piece. This is an interesting piece. It's beautiful uh, uh, sea light from uh, Nanzhu Bading in uh, China. Uh, very gemmy, uh, large orange uh, crystal. And, and the, the whitish crystals with it are, are tabular aquamarines, but they've been etched from the inside out. So they look, they look white because they, they won't allow light to go through it. But uh, you actually have clean faces in every one of these, uh, these crystals. And they're, they're, uh, they're aquas, but they have an unusual uh, uh, usual coloring as a consequence. And this one's at the Perot Museum also. And this is where uh, the panda preserves are. So there's no more, absolutely no more digging there um, due to disturbing the pandas. And this is a big, what I call the tie-dye, or what we call the tie-dye fluorite. Um, pretty spectacular piece, well lit. Looks great. It has this, this uh, bright blue. Um, uh, we've had this for quite a while now. Um, not very many pieces like that. There was a recent collection of the Perhaps the finest collection of these in the world uh, came on uh, for sale here this uh, past year or so, and it was the first time I'd seen so many of these. We're going to try to move along. Well, we only have one or two on. left. Um, this is this is uh, what used to be from the Ukraine, now from Russia, the Crimea. <laughs> uh, Vivianite on barite. But isn't so this I thought beautiful? I'd throw my political I think it looks twist like a flower. in there. I think it's beautiful. But it's uh, just a gorgeous piece. It's radial spray of uh, it looks Vivianite. Like it's, it's sitting in an egg. And, and just as I said, we were about done. Yeah. Beautiful and purple she light. And uh, we did find many fine minerals, and I thank you for coming and listening. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.